the Trapolo Podcast. I'm your host, Dan Runcy. Our guest today is Carl Folks, who is an entertainment and art lawyer at the Folks Firm. He is a professor as well at Drexel and Rowan. He's also an entrepreneur. Carl, welcome to the podcast, man. It's really, really, really great to be here. I mean, I'm now a Trapital member, but I've been I've been following the campaign for a while now, and it, it, you, you're a real value add to the community. Thanks, man. I appreciate that. One of the things I really enjoy about your platform and the content you put out is the passion that you have for producers, and everyone knows the role that they have and why they're important, but let's hear a little bit about what sparked that for you. What drove the interest in making sure that producers' rights were heard and represented? I think you come into any sort of structure looking to, to fix problems or at least trying to be add to the community. Uh, and advocacy has always been, you know, something in my spirit and, you know, I went to law school to advocate uh, and, you know, I had friends who were producers. I saw their struggles. Uh, a lot of them, uh, you know, weren't getting paid on time, you know, were getting jerked around on splits, um, didn't know how to register their publishing. So oftentimes their publishing that was registered was off um, and a lot of human error, human error involved uh, just halted a lot of uh, people from making a lot of money. So, you know, there's so much stuff now coming about out about publishing, you know, with producers. Um, I thought I could re- be a real value add to that community and, and, and sort of bring education and, and empowerment. Do you think that the power and this place that producers have had has changed over time? Do you think it's gotten any easier or harder in the digital era that we're now in, in the streaming era? I think it, pro- producing music has become easier. And for a bunch of reasons, I think it's almost lowered the value of uh, of a beat or what an, instru- of an instrumental is. Um, you talk to people in the 90s, right, you know, Premiere, you know, they were getting 100K a beat. You know, uh, there, were, there were a lot of people tapping in, making these, having these huge budgets. And, and now one producer is sending a loop to another producer and he's finishing that beat or she's finishing that beat. And that, that song, that's how a lot of beats are getting made. So... Um, not saying there's not a lot of producers, you know, still crafting them up like the old days. There is, there's a, there's a fair amount, but uh, even just getting quality beats uh, is just easier. And I think that's hurt the the fight for producer rights. That was something I wrote about a year and a half ago. It was one of the more polarizing articles I wrote, but it did gain a bit of traction. It was about how hip hop producers, at least at the top level, lost their power over time because going back years the mega producers with your timbaland and neptunes there was a time when neptunes had almost 50 percent of the songs on top 40 radio and as big as uh mike will is or zaytoven or any of the other big stars are today i feel like the commoditization of the market not only makes it harder for them, but it makes it harder for all the people that are trying to be them. So in that way, it creates more opportunities to make sure that the people that are just making the best beats and selling them for, you know, a few hundred bucks, and then it ends up being on a big track, like a Drake record or something like that, making sure that they have stuff set up can be a lot harder. So in that way, it does give you work to help represent those folks you know i almost think though the, the producers that are following the, the blueprint that that was laid by uh the last generation are still sort of at the top like a jetson made right um jetson got in the studio with the baby uh continues to move around uh and, and build that sound and he's on a, he, he you know obviously doesn't have that neptune's market share but uh he has a lot of placements on the in the top 100 uh, the Billboard Top 100, and he's one of those guys that leaves his house, uh, really focuses on building with, directly with artists. Uh, so I think the secret sauce is still there, and for for a lot of producers, um, it's become so technical and easy to craft a sound and send out a beat pack. You know, they're not networking like they used to, or not building in the studio like they used to. Uh, a great example of this would be a producer who gets hot off a beat star beat, right? Someone buys the beat star beat, and then you know the artist wants to work in studio and you just don't know what you're doing in studio. You don't know how to craft a sound. You don't know how to, to executive produce. So um, that I see that happening a lot. That happens all the time. Would you say those are the type of cases you deal most with? 
Just because of the way I marketed myself, I think I get a lot of producers who might be getting their first or second placement uh, contacting me about what to do. And it's fairly streamlined, right? There's not too much movement, especially if you have uh, this, this is your first or second placement, right? There's an advance, uh, $5,000 maybe. There's points on the record, three points. Uh, and then there's your publishing. And, and and that's really it. It's fairly streamlined. And, but, you know, a lot of times what happens is artists and people in the industry really don't know anything about publishing, have no clue how that the publishing realm works. The, it, what happens is producers end up getting jerked out of uh, their splits uh, just because um, someone at the label or someone uh, who works in the industry told them, you know, this is a work for hire. You know, you know you're signing away all your, your, your residual income. So I think I deal with that a lot, a lot more. So it's a lot of education on your end. Yeah, that's why I don't feel like there's so much malice. And I don't even approach life uh, for, it, it, with, you know, I don't think people are always walking around with malicious intent. However, um, I just think it's a lack of education. And, um, you know, I, I'm lucky enough to have the bird's eye view. I think attorneys are 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 the people who deal in publishing and deal in the recorded music, who deal in touring, who deal in, in the agency space. Um, so I have that bird's eye view and I might be able to piece it together a little bit better uh, on where everything fits. And you might not, and that's okay. Um, so I think part of it is just education level. I think like <laughs> industry employees should have more education if, if, if I were to be completely honest. What made you want to go the route of starting your own firm? I could see someone with your talent being sought after by several of the other firms out there. But I mean, I think it's awesome you did it, but I'm curious, yeah, what was your track record to go that route? I, I just thought um, I was going to be very, very limited in my advocacy, um, you know, working under someone or working with someone, because uh, there are a lot of factors uh, that come into it. Business is business and, you know, you're not always going to be on the same page. And I just don't want to be compromised in and my, my mission and, and what I want to do. So I felt that, um, you know, I almost had to establish myself on my own and, and create this monster and, um, you know, and either bring people on or partner maybe in the future. But uh, I just think that every, what, what every day goes by, there's another problem that comes up that I, that I want to help or address. So I, I think for me, my, I want to get the folks firm to that, to that pole position. Do you think that it's easy to be able to attract folks? Because at least from what I see from your perspective, Twitter and Instagram and LinkedIn, a lot of these places, the same way that there are independent creators like myself creating content, there is opportunity for the independent lawyer to be able to do that in the same way. And just because the field of practice may seem a bit more traditional than most think, there's still opportunity to do something like that. Well, you, if you think of the legal, especially entertainment law structure, it really doesn't make sense that a lot of people continue to get clients, right? Um, just because you're not marketing yourself necessarily to the next generation. You're relying on strictly referrals, uh, which is okay, right? I think that's like ideally where you want to get to. But um, I thought that if I became a factor and you, know, you want to be first to mind when something comes up, they already knew who I was. I was sort of already embedded in the culture and I'm sort of running on that campaign and strategy. So it's like, um, it's the machine versus grassroots. Like we're coming at different angles. Sometimes I lose out on a deal because there's some shuffling on the, you know, politically. Uh, but other times I'm beating you to the punch because, you know, lawyers are, market themselves very archaically, right? You know, mm -hmm. I am using Twitter and Instagram. Um, but that's also just because I was that kid that I'm trying to pursue uh, or try to help. I was, I'm, and, and I look like them and I, and I sort of talk like them, but you know, there's also credibility. And um, you know, I, I just wanted to be first to mind when opportunity came. And I also wanted to position myself as someone that um, you don't have to look too hard to find. Right. That makes a lot of sense. And I would imagine now that you're probably getting a fair amount of inbound where you do have to be diligent in terms of who you want to take on and who you don't. Is there a particular type of level that you see in a producer come through where it's like, okay, I'm not going to look at you till you're here. Maybe you could work with someone else, but get to this level and then we can talk. Yeah. You know, I've almost made a cognizant uh, shift in not taking as many producers and getting more in the recorded music side, uh, which is, you know, I, if I had a, a practice 
not like ideal practice uh, balance. I think it would be half producers, maybe half half recorded music uh, artists. So that's where I'm sort of at with it. Um, yeah, you know, inbound is, is is hectic. I'm probably getting four or five different emails a day, um, which, which to me was in, is indicative of the scarcity of entertainment lawyers and who who are willing to play in the dirt. I would say, and not and not in a bad way. Just you know, help people out before you know, they really can pay for it. Um, and um, so th- that that's one thing I realized. But I think for me, pro- producers are um, important figures in music and they are the least represented. And for me, I've always been the underdog type. So uh, I think I'll always be a champion and always try to uh, create and unionize and, and, and bring everyone together. But uh I also learned that the recorded music is is where if we're if we're talking about the actual dollar amount, you know, the co- recorded music is where the, the money is. Okay, I was going to ask you if that was the reason why you wanted to have that fifty fifty split. <laughs> yeah, no, y- yeah, I mean, to some, even though publishing has become hot, right? You know, hypnosis and all these different publishing companies and investment arms and uh, people outside of music are starting to take a liking to the residual nature of publishing where you kind of get to sit back and maybe have a small sync team that goes out and tries to, you know, uh, get sync licensing opportunities. And you just kind of sit back and watch the, the publishing accumulate over years. You buy it for a four or five times multiple and sometimes as high as 10 and it's a wacky space. And, and, you know, seven years from now, that song can be part of a viral moment and you make it all back in one year. It's just about, you know, creating that opportunity. I think, you know, publishing, publishing is hot right now. It's the white hot space in music, in my, in my opinion. Publishing is hot. It's still a white space and still, I guess, similar to producers' rights, one of the most under-discussed and I think confusing areas for artists coming up. And it makes me think of that music publishing exam that you had put out. So for those that don't follow Carl, as I mentioned, he's a professor, both Rowan and Drexel, and he put out a music publishing exam that he gave out to his students. And of course, some of the people that are following him took the exam. I'll be honest, I didn't take it just because I was scared. I probably wasn't going to get something back that I didn't want to see, but I will take it at some point. But I think that just echoes the education aspect and it doesn't just brand yourself, but it highlights the importance of that area. For sure. And I think, um, you know, the reason why I put that out there is because I, I do challenge people in the industry because I don't think they know enough about the, the weeds of publishing, especially if you're not in publishing and that's not a knock to, to, to anyone. I just think publishing is a, sometimes can be a tough concept, but I, I think it's important and um, I think we all should familiar, familiarize ourselves with, with uh, the nature of the business. So, you know, I put that up and I didn't think it was going to get the response. It was, <laughs> I was like, you know, here's a, you know, here's a publishing exam and, you know, 500 people have taken it already. Um, so, you know, I'm proud of that. But, you know, I, I think uh, it showed me that if I can galvanize the community and engage the community uh, the way I do it via Twitter, very direct. Um, I can also get them to challenge themselves to to learn more about uh, different parts of music business. And I think that's just education is key. What was the average score on the exam? Uh, better than I thought. It was like 80. It was like okay. 80 out of 100, which was, I, I thought was super, super uh, impressive. But I think the dil- the, a lot of diligent people were the ones who ended up taking that exam, right? That's true. It is a bit self-selecting as I self-selected myself out of it. All right. There was like professors, you know, a bunch of people in academia hit me up and, you know, commended me for, for that exam and also took it. And, you know, a lot of other people that you might know uh, in the industry sort of who, who have just a good understanding of things took it and, and did well. But, um, yeah. Do you think, I guess, going back to your career in general, do you think that you enjoy having the one-to-many type model of, yes, as I grow and grow, having numerous clients? Or do you see over time eventually being the lawyer for so-and-so, like the go-to person for the rising super, for, for the superstar? I wouldn't even say it's changing right now in front of my eyes, right? My model is almost being flipped because I really want it. It's, it's a very contradicting model at times just because 
I want to get the information out to everybody, but I don't want to, because the people I am involved with, I want to give them top-notch service. I want to be engaged, not just from the legal aspect, but strategy uh, and representation uh, in every sense of the word. So um, it's hard to do that when you have 150 clients, right? Um, but, you know, you have 15 clients who all pay well, who are all, you know, juggernauts, you know, that's another, that's another thing. So for me, I, it's about finding that balance, but I'm, I'm never going to stop using my platform to the code language, uh, you know, to, to educate, to, to give information that I, I don't think was being given before me. I'm, I'm, it, this is real time stuff, right? I'm doing deals and, and I'm sort of talking about some of the deals, you know, in real time. I like that perspective. It makes me think a lot. I think most of the people listening, the lawyer they're probably most familiar with in the hip hop entertainment space would be the late Combat Jack, Reggie Yose, and a lot of the work he did. And I also think if you're listening to this podcast, you probably listen to Mogul as well. And and I think that podcast did a good job of showing his story, but still that he's like one person out of many people that had those types of roles. And I think his story just came to light because he happened to use his platform for, to, for podcasting later on down the road. Which I thought was it. Combat Jack to me is one of the more important people in music business history, just for being someone who was in the game, uh, really in hip hop, doing big deals uh, and stay true to himself, but sort of spent the re- later half of his life decoding the game and, you know, having fun with an introducing, breaking down the business behind the culture. Yeah. I, I also admire the resiliency too. I think hearing one of his stories that like Jay-Z and the Rockefeller team fired him, that could be such a blow to most people, but no, he kept going. And I will tell you this, I've never resonated more in my life than that, just because um, he talked about him feeling that, you know, other black people felt like white ice was colder. And right. I, it, it's a real struggle I have just because of the way I look and the way I dress sometimes or the way I might speak. Uh, even though I, you know, I think I'm extremely credible and I've proven it time and time again. Um, I definitely think there's that hurdle that you want someone who is a 55 year old, you know, white guy or something like that. And that's fine. And, you know, the credibility has to get built over time. And I'm, I'm one of those people who appreciates the, the, the process, but you know, I, I have lost out on deals, uh, in my opinion, not because I wasn't qualified or credible or I couldn't do the job just because, um, you know, I felt that people had a perception of what a lawyer was supposed to look like. Of course, these are people that look like you as well that I'm sure have a lot of these judgments. And I think that's the thing that's tough. I know that Combat Jacket spoke about that, like the several people have talked about that. But yeah, I think the fact that you're not compromising authenticity at all to try to get to that point Also, you being able to stay true to that helps keep the narrative forward because we don't want that to be an issue and that should not be an issue moving forward. So hopefully the next generation of uh, lawyers and attorneys don't have to deal with that. Right. And, you know, quite frankly, I hope there's going to be less lawyers, you know, 20 years from now, just because, you know, I think smart contracts could and and, and blockchain could really, really help. especially the producer business, a lot of this stuff could be streamlined payment. Um, you know, th- this co- most of the contracts and agreements are standard, or maybe there's a couple points you might pick, but it's all just um, excessive and, and over the top. And, you know, I feel like there's a lot of people in this industry who are just worried about keeping their job as opposed to uh, moving things forward. And, you know, that's, I, I think that's just the real, that's the reality of it. I think technology, you know, is that, I think we're all self-preserving to some extent, but um, things have to get a, a little bit more uh, technically savvy in the music business, especially in terms of paying people and some of the older concepts have to go. Can you say more about blockchain? How do you think that will be able to lead to having less lawyers down the road? Publishing is, um, the, the most direct area, I think, where blockchain could help um, just because it's, it's very hard for um, Tune Registry is one of those companies that, that does a good job of providing a service that registers everything at once. Um, but there's so much discrepancy and splits. You know, I'm, I'm in the middle of something right now where, you know, someone just doesn't. One person says, you know, this is their split. Another person says that was their split. 
and contracts get mixed up and lost. And it's all elementary stuff too, right? I don't think either any of us are like, all right, I mean, like, come on, that's human error. But from going from I got the placement to getting paid via ASCAP, BMI, Harry Fox is an, is a process that's convoluted and it should be one um, you should be able to upload across, you know, on, on you put something on blockchain and it's, it's sort of like, you know, uploads across, you know, globally, you know, if not globally, at least nationally for now. Uh, so, you know, all this stuff can be registered, but now, you know, everyone's not playing ball. Right. Yeah. This reminds me of um, the conversation I had with Milana Lewis. He's the CEO of STEM. I know you've suggested your artists to your, your clients to use STEM and ultimately the goal of that platform and the way it's been used helps eliminate a lot of this because so many of the percentages and points are already built in. So when the streaming goes out, there shouldn't need to be as much intervention. Right. There's so much, there's so many people pushing buttons uh, that it just, it doesn't make sense. And um, so many hands exchanging of hands, you know, with some of the information that it doesn't make sense. So, uh, I think we do have to embrace technology as as time goes. I think the music business is one of those frustrating businesses because uh, even if you look back, streaming wasn't embraced, right? We didn't. It's pretty, the, the idea of streaming was around before we embraced streaming fully. We embraced streaming because we had to. It was almost the last resort to save the industry. Like <laughs> everything was bad. Everything right. was getting leaked, you know. And the, the, the counter. To counter leaking, leaking, you were almost like, all right, we have to find a way to get this music up accessibly and that, that people could, you know, just click around, even though we might make less money or losing more money by, you know, you know, not having an alternative. So we didn't even embrace streaming the way we should have embraced streaming. So I, I'm looking at blockchain as sort of the next thing that we're not embracing because of this, that and that. But uh, if you're an artist manager, especially if you're a manager or a creative blockchain is amazing for you. I think if you're in business, maybe it's not so amazing. Money exchange changes hands in a way that is more beneficial to everyone and embraces transparency. And maybe that's not something you want. Right. Yeah. I think people start paying attention to blockchain. The Obviously, the more valuable Bitcoin ends up being. That shouldn't be the bellwether. This is not need to be a blockchain podcast, but that is not need to be the bellwether of the interested in following it. But no, I do think a lot of that stuff makes sense. And it's funny hearing what you said about just the industry and how it relates to streaming. I think there's a lot of people that still don't feel like the industry is fully embraced it. Just looking at the archaic way Billboard still wants to measure hits with the album bundles and stuff like that. That's because we don't want to embrace streaming yet. So yeah, there is still a long way to go for the industry to catch up. I'm curious. So you have a lot of these skills that you're not only developing, but then the network that you have, a lot of it's invested in the music industry, but I would assume that there's extensions and opportunities outside of that in entertainment. Do you see yourself expanding? Yeah, I think for me, uh, the music industry is one of those industries, though, where I don't think you have one foot in and one foot out if you're an attorney. Like you, I think you almost have to be a music lawyer just because the nuances and the in- intricacies of the game uh, from publishing the recorded music to streaming and uh, all the moving parts are so intricate and detailed that if you're not in a game um, and you're not actively looking over these agreements or having conversations or in these rooms, um, you're not going to be you know able to compete on a, on a higher level. So right now I'm sort of all in on music. Um, but I do fathom uh, that one day uh, it will be bigger than, you know, sports was my first passion and will probably will always be, um, you know, I, I think it's just an influence thing, right? Just just getting to that top level of, you know, I, my goal is to really be the top entertainment industry attorney. Um, and, you know, now I want to do it while serving the masses. That's why right. I use my platform to educate as opposed to, uh, withhold information because you know that uh, you you got to serve right. I think about music licensing and the trends that are going there. 
I mean, a lot of artists are starting to get their music featured more and more on the streaming platforms, just given the opportunities. So in some ways, even though you have this vested interest, you do have to have at least one ear out to what's being developed in the video streaming landscape, whether it's a Netflix or whoever, just knowing that your artists are going to have more of those opportunities. Yes. And I think that's why it's important to build the network uh, people in and outside of music. I think going to school like Villanova, that's where I went to law school, helped me sort of build that network of people who might be entertainment adjacent, but not necessarily in, in entertainment. So uh, when we when we have conversations, um, they're talking about business and, you know, technology or uh, some other stuff that, you know, obviously are integrated in music, but aren't necessarily music. So um, I've just I, I'm, I continue to try to get out there and, and go to those conferences as well. And if I have an opportunity to do a continu- continuing legal education CLEs, uh, I'll I'll do those in in not necessarily entertainment fields. I do it in interge- entertainment adjacent fields to continue to broaden yourself because, uh, as you just said, <laughs> it all connects at some point. Right. Yeah, and I feel like I'm even seeing a flavor of that with some of the things you've been doing yourself on the entrepreneurial front. You have this series called The Courtroom. You're interviewing people, your videos, and you're using that as a platform not only to elevate, but to have those types of conversations. Yeah, and you know, for me, I think I really, you have to have a passion for, for this to be great, in my opinion. So um, I have no other, I think if I had a mission, state, uh, mission statement, it would be to um, sort of explore the business behind the culture. And, you know, that's all I'm trying to do. And I think I have a, a bird's eye perspective to ask the right questions and, you know, get the right people that push the, the next generation forward. But, you know, a lot of people love the culture in which I do. I kind of like the business behind the culture because, um, you know, for a while, African-Americans, black people have not owned the business behind the culture. So I, I'm sort of trying to inspire and educate and um, and do a lot of those things that make that just as attractive. And I'm starting to see it. You know, I'll tweet music business stuff and, you know, it, I think it hits the way like a, a hits maybe even more than a, a song link. You know what I'm saying? Or, or right. So I'm starting to see the consciousness shift inside the music industry that people are starting to care about the business behind the culture just as much as the culture. And to me, that's a beautiful thing. Yeah. The ownership discussion has gotten stronger and stronger, specifically among us and people that didn't necessarily have that. There's so much of a um, default to find the established place, and the established place was often run by people that didn't necessarily look like you, and therefore, in many ways, you could be contributing to that same cycle. But those that at least are willing to own there is a trade-off either way, no matter what you get. But if you're willing to push that as far as you can go, I do think that people surprise themselves. The ownership conversation is a bit much for me because I think it overshadows. Um, it's it's a broad statement that doesn't really address some of the intricacies of what a good deal or what a bad deal is about being realistic. Uh, you know, at certain points in your your career, um, I think the royalty rate is is a bigger problem than ownership. You know, artists are getting 16 to 18% of the master royalty and labels are getting, you know, 82%. It, I don't, if, if it was 50, 50 and they own the record, I guess, I mean, would it be that bad? Um, maybe, maybe that's the next step, but you know, the problem is not just controlling the asset. It's what you're getting off the asset. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't think people are looking at that part enough. Yeah, I think the nuance gets lost and it can be especially hard to communicate that type of nuance on Twitter or wherever else. And that is one of the things that I often write about in Trapital articles. And I do think that the people that dislike the nuance have pushed back on those articles. But whether it's a Chance the Rapper or Russ and a lot of these other artists that are like gung-ho pushing this narrative, I often find myself being like, Eh, you know, sometimes deals aren't necessarily the worst thing in the world because when we look at it, you all took some type of deal, whether it was Russ and doing a distro with Columbia or Chance and his Apple deal. Like, not doing a deal isn't this like devil sin. We need to be able to look at it more clearly. And the percentage points that which I think the people that follow this get it, but if you don't understand the difference, then don't just throw the terms out there. 
Right. But, you know, I think it's a bigger conversation in the music industry. It's a self-awareness conversation. Guys like Mick Jenkins and Russ and, um, and Chance the Rapper, um, they're, they're, they are community driven. They cultivate their, their communities. They engage. They are master marketers. And they do that themselves with their teams. And that's capable. How many people are capable of doing that? You know, and some people don't want to do it. Some people really just rather have their publicists or, you know, everyone, everything just be set up for them. And right. that's just the nature of it. You can't expect everyone to, to have that, uh, that fight. And, and I think that's the part that made me okay with uh, some of the things I've had to do just because, you know, at first I was like, man, you know, wanted my client to do that deal. And it was honest though. It's, it's because you aren't built right now. And I don't think you even show that sort of fortitude to, develop that team and leadership that you'll need to be an independent artist. Uh, I think it's okay to partner with someone and make a lot of money together. Um, it's, it's the way we look at that relationship. I think that's, that's toxic. Um, however, there, there's so many, there's, there are predatory terms in, in recording contracts and, you know, I think record labels have done predatory things in the past and still do today. So, um, you know, it's, it's a fluid conversation. And I think companies like Human Resources, Troy Carter and those those guys and um, companies like STEM and that are sort of allowing that are that, that have some money and that are giving you transparency and data uh, so you can go out there and fuel your own ship. I think they are sort of the antithesis to what these labels are. And it's coming to a head. It's either, you know, we're going to come this way and we're going to track a lot more people because the people are starting to believe that it's possible uh, on this side. So what that's doing is making these deals on this side better and less predatory. Do you think that this landscape looks the same in terms of the companies that are trying to help establish and empower artists to dictate their own path like a STEM and the way that the record labels are now? Because it does seem like the culture has definitely evolved in terms of this mindset and not to take anything away from your master P's or your DJ screws that were doing this from the, you know, decades ago, but we are at a current point where this feels like we are in a wave where this is often what we've heard about for the past five or six years. Where do you see this conversation going six years from now? Do you think that it changes in any way? I, I think artists in particular have, uh, are full of it. Like, you know, everyone wants to go independent until the labels start caring about them. And then it seems like every almost every single time uh, that, that, you know, I want to go independent, I want to go the distance goes away. Right. So it's only artists to really make this shift. Like the late, the, I don't see a universe in, in a willing universe where uh, the corporation is going to make, just amend their deals, with, you know, for, for no reason, really. I think it's, the, it's more, I want to see more artists sort of, who have that big potential shirt deals and, and do business at a high level and, and win. I would love to see that. I think there's also alter, alternative funding sources. Uh, I think we go to the well, well every single time. I think music can be packaged, you know, merch, touring, future revenue can be packaged just like, you know, a startup could be packaged. So um, I, I think alternative revenue sourcing is, uh, is something that I think, uh, that I would like to see more. And I actually think there's a, there's a real possibility that that becomes a thing. So what would that look like? The alternative revenue source? What, what are some examples? Well, yeah, you, you I'm, I'm sure you, you, you have to have some numbers, but I mean, if you have a streaming business and a publishing business already, then you can show them how much you're making and with, with, with added money, uh, you know, same with merch with that. If you, with, we need money. Because which most which is the biggest reason why any of these kids sign these deals they need money and they want money and they you know that's just that's just the nature of it. Um, with 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 some money, I'll give you a split of a split give you a split of this. And every artist should have their loan out or their their company that they're operating of. You know, I think you can give equity in the company, um, not in, this, in the same similar way that you're giving equity in in a startup. I don't think it's that insane of a concept. You know, everyone looks at me kind of kind of crazy when I bring it up, but I'm like, you know, everyone wants to get into the business of culture. You know, people investment, people in you know, an investment side. It's not like you're asking for that much money. You know, people who invest in uh, all sorts of stuff and you know, start up and give you fifty percent, or uh, they they or a better way is like you'll get um, 
you'll get stock that'll vest over years, right? And you and you'll put in on a safe note, you'll put in 50k. Um, there's a lot of investors willing to, to put in 50k, and I think the return in music could be very, very big. Right. You know, if you go to four or five different investors and get 50k, and you can a lot of these businesses do become multi million dollar business with with real assets long term. So. Mm-hmm. Um, it's just a how, it's how we're thinking about this. Right. No, that's a good point. It reminds me of a conversation I had with uh, Dame Ritter. I know you were on his podcast a couple months ago. He had worked with Russ before Russ had blown up. And Russ had came to him like, hey, I'm looking for people to invest in my career right now. This is an opportunity to ride the train with me. Here's the dollar amount. Do you want to invest? And Dame said no. He regretted saying no. I think part of it was because, you know, I think he was still a little bit unsure. He had some um, turnover with the startup that he was working on, but I think otherwise he would have went with it. And But he did note out that even the fact that Russ came and asked him that question, that isn't necessarily the type of way that most artists think about their business and how they can go about building what they need to do. Most people don't know how relatively easy it is to, to raise money. I'm not saying it's easy. Uh, I think if you're willing to give up a piece of your business, but you should be, I think you can get money. Um, especially if you have numbers to back it. You, if you have a merch business that, that, that shows, uh, you know, progress. If you have a streaming business that shows progress. Um, so you, I, I think it's about packaging it the right way and going out there and offering a unique package. So yeah, I think we just keep going to the, I think people, artists keep going to the well. Um, and, you know, as long as that well is, is in control, they, they hold all the cards and all the power. So there's no need for them to alter their business really at all. I mean, they're being nice. And I think public pressure and I guess a distribution companies like, you know, human resources and, you know, all these other companies are United masters putting pressure on you and they're loud and, they're really, really loud. So I think you start feeling that it feels bigger than it really is. But kids are still succumbing to that million dollar bag. Right. I think that's the thing that's tough. There's so much great information that's out there. And I do think that has leveraged the fact that barriers are broken down so that can be communicated. But there is still nothing that stops the feeling of someone that did not grow up with the most money in the world and now they're rising in their career and a record label is like, here is this seven figure deal. Let's go. And the education is supposed to just make them turn away. Like they're still human beings. And that's what makes me think that even though we make progress, I don't know if we fully move away from the power that that has. Yes. Sometimes I'm like, I don't even know if I would turn that down. What if you get a million dollars for a three project deal? It's not the end of the world, especially if you have a business that is, um, you know, it's about self-awareness. I, I think I champion that concept in music more so than anything else. That's a life concept, but you got to know what you are. Not everyone's built to be Drake, but every person wants to have that Drake level success. And I think it's bad. Everyone's like, you should be trying to be your, you market someone who, sh- who shouldn't be Drake, like a Drake, right? You try to put it, it is not going to work out. The Mick Jenkins of the universe, they do well in every city. They sell out shows. They sell hard tickets. And um, they build real, real fans. And they live a happier, probably life. And, you know, that's just the nature of it. So I think we have – I think artists and their teams and even labels have to know what's worth putting money into. Just because something is going viral doesn't really showcase that this person could grow a, a, a ten, five to ten-year sustaining business. It's really hard. Agreed, especially in this era now where people blow up so fast, you can become a TikTok meme overnight, your streams are blowing up, you don't really know what happened. And if you don't have the infrastructure in there in place to help support you, I don't care how many people are doing your dance. Yeah, you know, I think a lot of times labels are almost irresponsible, like banks were during the recession, you know, when they're giving out all those loans for homes and, you know, all these companies were giving out mortgages. uh, Mm -hmm when they knew that like, you know, the mortgages were toxic. And it's, you know, for me, it's like how many deals get signed a week that, that the label knows that we'll never make it back. Uh, and that kid will never be able to release music after the first project doesn't hit. I think that's a real conversation. It's, you know, and it's, it's very, very irresponsible. I'm as, I think I'm as fluid as it gets in terms of being 
truly, truly in the middle. I think certain labels are really, really good. And I think you're signing the people just as much as you are signing to a company. And there are some really, really good labels out there and really good people outside lab- inside labels. Um, we have progress to be made in terms of some of the predatory terms on the contracts. Um, but, you know, they hold value in this space and there's no doubt about that. And like I, I, some people should be signing deals and I have no problem saying that. On the other side, there are a bunch of artists who don't realize the power that they have and, you know, how real it is for them to build their social media, most social media follower following by themselves, which, which a lot of these kids have already done, right? Steve Stout talked about that in your interview. He talked about how back in the day, the label will help you create your community. It's funny how things have shifted. And I think that kids are at least are starting to realize that they have a lot of that power that the labels once had. So if you're going to sign that deal, just make sure that you're fully aware what you don't have that you are then being able to get. Like, what is that delta? What is the difference? Yeah. I'm also very hard on all the artists that cry to the public when things go bad. I'm just not buying it. I think you knew what that deal was. And I think you saw that piece of paper and there are consequences to, to that. And So you didn't feel bad for the Migos when they said that 300 was the worst label in the world? No, not really. I mean, you know, here, here's the thing. I can I can feel what he's what they're saying. It's just what's the recourse? Because there's a peep. Are we going to say that these pieces of paper aren't binding anymore? Um, I think that's also dangerous, right? People should be held to uh, to what they sign, and you, there's a price. There's a price to pay regardless. But them feeling that way is completely fair. Um, now now whether that label wants to just drop them, like a lot of the public thinks it's. Or, or give everyone their masters back, you know, after they invested millions of dollars in, do I think it should be that easy? No. Like, I, I think it's a, it's an interesting conversation. I think it's the root of the, the problem is the initial deal and the, the initial paperwork and your willingness to, to sign. Yeah. And I think what gets lost in the public discourse of those discussions, and not that I necessarily consider myself to be pro or anti-label by any means, but like, if an artist goes and puts the label on blast, who is going to win in the court of public opinion? Most artists have stronger brands than their labels. People care more about the Migos than they do about 300. They care more about Rich the Kid than they do about 300. Getting the support from the public may feel great because, yes, your 20 million Instagram followers got your back. But what does that necessarily do for what's actually happening with the deal that was signed? I think that gets worse over time than better. It does, but it also handicaps. I think it's being a politic, or as I say in LA, politic, and I think that's still important, right? Because, you know, I think once you go go to the media, you're sort of putting a gun to someone's head. And, you know, I, I just couldn't imagine, imagine someone saying, like, we're going to just abide. I think that's the worst strategy ever. I think so many artists keep doing that, and most labels just don't care. I'm like, all right, we're just not going to answer your call. Why would you do that? Like, we've had conversations before. It's not like you probably couldn't get a hold of anyone. Um, you just didn't like something in your deal that you signed. Have any of your artists done this? You don't have to put anyone individually on blast, but has any of them done it? Yes. I've been with, I've been with, a, I, I had a client and, you know, and, and that client outed someone that, that ended up, in my side, being a very good friend in the business. So it was a very unique situation. Um, and I think early on in my career, I was so, I was eager to, to take opportunity that I was bit in that sense where I would be like, yeah, let's, you know, you, you cry wolf and I'm following, I'm going to go and we're going to go beat this big machine. And as I kept learning and uncoding and, um, really doing my research and history and that emotion and that advocacy that one just, just from gross advocacy, uh, wore away, I was like, you know, this isn't, this isn't, this isn't the label's fault a lot of times. Right. Right. No, it's interesting. Well, we covered a lot in this podcast, but before we let you go, is there one piece of advice or one thing that you want to let the Trapital audience know about? Uh, Know yourself and like self-awareness. I've said it multiple times today, um, but not everyone's meant to be a megastar, but if you if you make a lot of money off your craft and your music and what you do and you change lives, uh, you are a star. So I think 
don't compromise your bigger vision uh, and sold a, and then get sold a dream that's not your dream. Uh, I think that's the biggest thing. No, well said. You going to give a plug for the courtroom? Yeah, the courtroom's out on YouTube. Uh, Carl Folks, K R L F O W L K E S. Uh, it's, it's on my channel. Uh, you can follow me on social as well. Uh, but but in reality, you know, this year I'm, I'm in the I'm in, I'm in the gritty right now. I'm getting these deals done. <laughs> nice. No, definitely go follow him. This guy knows his stuff, and I'm excited to see what he keeps doing. Carl, it's been a pleasure, bro. Yeah, thank you, man. If you enjoyed this podcast, please tell at least one friend about this podcast. Word of mouth is still the best way to grow. Go to Apple Podcasts, go to iTunes, leave a review, rate the podcast. I will screenshot and share the podcast ratings on Twitter and Instagram. That can encourage more people to share the podcast. And if this podcast is your first introduction to Trapital, then make sure you check out the rest of the content. Go to Trapital.co. That's T-R-A-P-I-T-A-L dot C-O. Sign up for the weekly newsletter. Get all the content there and also shoot me a text that's also a great way to stay in touch with travel content you can text me dan runcy at 415-234-3074 thanks again see you next week